Wojtek Fudali was born August 31, 1986 in Poland and grew up in Wilbraham, Massachusetts. He later moved to Rhode Island and attended the University of Rhode Island. In 2008, he graduated from the university with a bachelor's degree in international business. Six months after he graduated, on December 6, 2008, 22-year-old Wojtek went to a bar called Charlie O's and then attended a party at a friend's home in the West Bay at 70 block of East Shore Road in Narragansett and stayed overnight. The group was awakened sometime after 5 a.m. to the sight of Wojtek standing naked, hitting himself with a metal pole from the bed frame and saying, trust me. However, they were unable to get the pole from him and he eventually calmed down and his friends returned back to sleep. When his friends woke up the next afternoon, Wojtek was gone and the clothing he'd worn the night before was neatly folded on the floor. He also left his sneakers, car keys, cell phone, Massachusetts driver's license, debit card, and $86 in cash. Wojtek was seen twice after he left his friend's home. The first sighting was by some neighbors who saw a naked man that resembled him sitting on a dock at 8.30 a.m. Later, a book was found left open to a section that read, One with the Sea. The second sighting happened two hours later when a passerby saw him running towards a marsh, still nude, near Galilee Escape Road on the grounds of the 120-acre Galilee Bird Sanctuary. However, neither of these sightings have ever been confirmed to be him. Police canines searched the cove and nearby marsh but found nothing. His friends stated he seemed depressed and despondent prior to his disappearance and was acting oddly the last time they saw him, but his mother, Anna, spoke to him three days before he disappeared and stated that she didn't notice anything wrong. His roommate stated he had become interested in nature and very into religion and had spent a great deal of time reading the Bible in the days before his disappearance. He began underdressing for the cold weather and would walk around outside with no shoes on. He talked about trying a simpler life and even mentioned possibly going on a bread and water diet. Wojtek suffered from ADHD and anxiety and took medication to help, but his friend said he abruptly stopped taking them prior to his disappearance. Temperatures outside on the day Wojtek disappeared was about 30 degrees, and he could not have survived long without his clothes. The day before he vanished, he was stopped by police on Newport's Cliff Walk. He wasn't wearing any shoes, and the police stated that he was inappropriately dressed for the weather and distraught. Around 3 a.m. on the morning he was reported missing for an unknown reason, police made a well-being check on one of his friends, Burton Wilkins, who was renting the home on East Shore Road. They noted that Wojtek was present at the home at the time. Little did they know they'd soon be looking for him. Strangely, about a year after he disappeared, his mother received a phone call from someone with a childlike voice asking for Wojtek. The call was traced to a woman in Puerto Rico. As more time passed, his mother found a post-it note in her kitchen with the following writing on it. His name was even spelled wrong on the post-it note. A handwriting analysis was brought in, but the results were inconclusive. It was just another curious lead that led nowhere. His mother believes that he is still alive. Sadly, she lost her oldest son to an overdose a few years before Wojtek went missing. As of today, he has never been found and the case remains unsolved. Donald Joseph Connell was born on October 31, 1958 and was nicknamed Donnie. In 1977, he graduated from the Rhode Island Middletown High School. He was very athletic and a very good baseball and basketball player. After school, he would join the U.S. Marine Corps just as his father had done before him. On December 2, 1986, in Newport, Rhode Island, 28-year-old Donnie left his parents' house at 6 Record Street and began walking to meet his sister, who was on her way home. He was going to meet her at her place, which was only one street away. However, when she arrived, Donnie was nowhere to be found, and it is unknown if he ever even made it. 
Donnie was reported missing by his father 10 days later on December 12, 1986. Because he was an adult, law enforcement did not thoroughly investigate his disappearance as being foul play. At the time, missing persons were not broadcast or published in media as widely as they are now, and there was no major search for him. There was not even a newspaper article about his disappearance. His family and the Newport police detectives are still trying to obtain his medical and dental records, but are having a tough time. Donnie isn't on the Doe Network yet, and that's due to the U.S. government not getting his medical records sent to his family for whatever reason. There are very few details available, and as of today, he has never been found, and the case remains unsolved. Wendy Lee Madden was born March 6, 1968. On March 11, 1991, Wendy was just five days shy of turning 23. She was the youngest of three children and had a rough childhood. In 1991, she had recently moved from Woonsocket, Rhode Island to live with her mother at 53 Cross Street in Central Falls. It was a cold, frigid night when Wendy left her mother and boyfriend at their home to walk a couple minutes away to Store 24, now called ABC Liquors, to buy some cigarettes. It is believed she made it to the store, and on her way home, she was seen talking to people closer to her house at 11.15 p.m. She was known for hanging out with an older and rough crowd. While she had no criminal record, she was allegedly dabbling in drugs and illegal activity. Later into the night, when she didn't show back up, her boyfriend and mother assumed she had gone to a friend's house like she often did. Two days later, on March 13th, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, behind a small local bar called Jan's Place, a neighbor in the area would find her body. She had been strangled and sexually assaulted, but her official autopsy results have never been released to the public. Wendy had been known to occasionally hang out at that particular bar and may have been there on the night she went missing. Her case is still in active investigation, and the detective on her case now has a Facebook page dedicated to solving Wendy's case. Police have a person of interest, but the name of this person has not been released to the public. Brian Dillon Nisenfeld grew up in New Jersey and was an honor student in high school. After high school, he would attend Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island. He is described as an introvert that enjoys reading, writing poetry, and listening to music. In January of 1997, 18-year-old Brian was beginning his second semester studying architecture. The architecture program was tough and he didn't do well his first semester and he was also very homesick. He told his dad he was changing his major and assured him that he would do better the next semester. On January 31, 1997, Brian received a threatening phone call from a former student at the college who said that he could get on campus and get him. The call scared Brian, so he called his father, Steve, at 12.30 a.m. and asked him to come to the university. His father told him to call campus security, and when he did, they told him to change his phone number. His advisor went to Brian's room, and he refused to give the name of the caller. Seven days later, on February 6, 1997, Brian would go missing. Surprisingly, Brian's parents were not notified that he was missing until February 12th, almost a week after he disappeared. Later, Brian's mother received a mysterious call from an unknown woman who claimed that the administrator of the university and two faculty members were withholding information about the case, but then the phone line went dead. The university denied this claim and authorities found no evidence the college officials were not forthcoming. Six months later, on Labor Day weekend 1997, a woman and her daughter were walking along Hog Island in Narragansett Bay near campus when they discovered a shoe on the shore. When they looked in the shoe, they found part of a foot inside. DNA tests showed that the foot, along with a shin bone found nearby, belonged to Brian. While they couldn't find any other remains, they do believe Brian is deceased, but they cannot determine what exactly happened to him. Some believe that Brian may have accidentally fallen into the river from the water's edge, or may have been distraught over personal problems or troubles in school and jumped from Mount Hope Bridge. 
the bridge is near Hog Island and is about 285 foot high, and Brian often spent time there writing poetry. However, his family and friends do not believe that he could have died accidentally or committed suicide and believe he was murdered. They also believe he may have been killed by the same person that was threatening him through the phone calls that occurred in the weeks before his disappearance. Josh Cohen later admitted to making the threatening phone calls. He was a friend of Brian's during his first semester, but the two had a falling out prior to Brian's disappearance. Josh said they were just made as a joke and that Brian had often made similar calls to him. His family believes that the former student was involved in Brian's disappearance and death, but the police do not believe he was involved. While Brian's parents do not believe the suicide theory, they do think it is possible that he may have accidentally fallen from the bridge. However, they lean toward believing their son was murdered and that Josh Cohen knows more than he is saying. Upset by the response at the university when his son vanished, Stephen Nisenfeld convinced the state representative to introduce legislation in Congress known as Brian's Law to require colleges and universities to notify parents if their children are missing for 24 hours. As of today, Brian has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Doreen Ann Marfio was born July 7, 1955, as Doreen Dobson. In 1976, she met Stephen Marfio, and the two married in 1978 and settled in Johnston, Rhode Island on Hartford Avenue. Doreen was the purchasing editor at the Rhode Island School of Design. In October of 1989, she abruptly quit her job, saying that she wanted a change. According to Stephen, she began behaving erratically, and at some points, she seemed on the edge of a nervous breakdown, but she refused to tell him what the problem was. On March 29, 1990, she didn't make her usual call to her mother, and when Stephen came home, Doreen was not there. She would never show back up, and he would wait two days before declaring her missing, and only after her mother threatened him to do it. When asked about her, he claimed that she had taken only a week's worth of clothes in a suitcase and had only $600 with her and did not take any of the fifty grand in the joint bank account. She left behind her curlers, toothbrush, pet cats, and 1984 Ford Tempo. She also left no note explaining where she may have gone. On the day of Doreen's disappearance, Stephen strangely took a 70-minute lunch break from work. His lunch breaks were usually only 20 to 30 minutes long. He claims he went home, ate lunch with Doreen, and went back to work. And when he returned home at 4 p.m. that day, she was gone. At the time of her disappearance, he suspected she was having an affair and had hired two separate private detectives to follow her for 11 months. However, there is no evidence that Doreen was actually being unfaithful and suspiciously, he never hired the private detectives to look for her after she disappeared. Investigators do not believe Doreen left of her own accord and believe that Stephen possibly murdered her. Her family says she was close to them and would never have left without contacting them. In June 1990, three months after she went missing, police received two letters. The first one stated that Stephen had strangled Doreen on the couch and dumped her body in a pond in Providence, Rhode Island. The second letter accused Doreen of having affairs with some of her co-workers, men which the letter identified by name. Both letters were typed on a typewriter from Stephen's mother's house, and authorities believe Stephen wrote them, although the letters referred to him in the third person. Police could find no evidence of an affair with any co-workers, and friends said that she would never even consider cheating on Stephen with someone from work. Interestingly, some of the names listed were of elderly or retired co-workers, making it more likely that the letter was merely written to defame her. When the police confronted Stephen about the letters, he hired an attorney and stopped cooperating in the investigation. In 1999, nine years after Doreen's disappearance, Stephen told his family members he was going on vacation to straighten out his life. Shortly after he returned, he shot and killed his ex-girlfriend, Laura Vincent, and seriously wounded her new boyfriend. He then drove to a secluded reservoir in Connecticut and committed suicide. 
He left a note for his mother which referred to his feelings of guilt about Doreen's disappearance, but did not say what happened to her. Stephen was never charged in connection with his wife's disappearance, but investigators believe he was responsible. A search of the area near where Stephen committed suicide turned up no trace of her remains, and as of today, she has never been found and the case remains unsolved.